Our scripture reading today is Philippians 3, 7, and 8. Philippians 3, 7, and 8. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted as loss for, for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Thank you, David. And good morning again to you. Um, I want to give us a little history lesson, a quick one that you probably are aware of, at least to some degree or another, and that is one of the most lucrative land deals in history was the Louisiana Purchase. In 1803, the U.S. worked out a deal, they brokered a deal with France and Spain to some degree, and they bought approximately 530 million acres of land, which amounts to about 828,000 square miles. Now, this land purchased um, contained all of present-day Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, part of Minnesota, um, much of North Dakota, nearly all of South Dakota, Northeast New Mexico, Northern Texas, parts of Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Louisiana, and including the city of New Orleans. It was this huge, huge, obviously, piece of real estate. A and they paid a ridiculously small investment for what we received in return at the time. In fact, different estimates, you know, it, it, I, the best I could figure, they paid about $38 an acre for that land. This morning, I want to look at a passage. It's a very short passage, and in its application, it kind of describes a similar investment for a corresponding return, and it's a two-sentence passage, actually, of how to obtain the kingdom of heaven, and in this passage, it is made absolutely crystal clear how to obtain the kingdom of heaven, yet with all of its clarity, the proposition that it makes to you and I today is one that will, many will find they're not willing to pay the price that is asked. This little two-sentence story that Jesus told is full of power and importance. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it sheds light on our path. It leads us to heaven. It points us to Jesus. And, and Lord, I'm praying today that as we spend some time here in just this very short passage that you will indeed point us to Jesus, that you will show us the path to the kingdom. And may you help us, Lord, to be willing to pay the price. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, whenever Jesus spoke to the people, he often used, or he frequently used different methods. And uh, you know, we always consider how meek and mild Jesus was, and he certainly was, at, at least in some ways. But one of the ways that Jesus used was open rebuke, and it was often to the religious people. Uh, he called them hypocrites and whitewashed tombs and et cetera, et cetera. He said things today that we would consider very politically incorrect. But Jesus knew the time frame for what was going on. He knew how short his people had before their time came to an end, so to speak. And so he pulled out all the stops trying to do everything he could to, to draw those people to him. Jesus almost always used illustrations from common life, things that those folks at his time could relate to. And um, at other times, Jesus used metaphors and parables that would illustrate what he was trying to teach to the people. And he would say things like, the kingdom of heaven is among you. 
And this kind of baffled the people. They didn't quite understand that. At least most of them didn't because nothing unusual was going on around them. As they looked around, everything seemed to be normal. Where was this kingdom, he said, was among them? And the results sometimes were blank stares and un, uh, a lack of comprehension, even sometimes among his disciples who were closest to him. He also told these down-to-earth stories about ordinary life, but he always added a twist to them. And within those stories that he told were the keys to the kingdom. You know, some of the familiar stories is he told the lady who lost her dowry, those ten pieces of silver, the shepherd who lost his sheep, the father who lost his son, the farmer who found a treasure in a field, uh, the fishermen who were casting their nets for uh, some fish, and a farmer who went out to sow in a field, and on and on and on. But in order to help the people understand, Jesus would tell these stories to try and get his message across to his hearers. If you would now, go with me to Matthew chapter 13. Here's where we find our little two-verse story that contains all we need to know to some degree about how to be in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, we're going to read verses 45 and 46. Matthew 13, verse 45 and 46. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says this, again, Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went out and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, there are a couple of ways to interpret who this or what this pearl might mean. And of course, the obvious things would be uh, the pearl could mean you and I, and also the, uh, it could mean Jesus. And of course, we know that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And, and there's a case that could be made that we are the pearl that's referred to here. And we'll, we'll actually allude to that a little later in the message. But I want to focus our attention on Jesus, who is the pearl of great price. And so go with me in your imagination back to this time when this might have taken place, this story that Jesus told. We're in this open air eastern marketplace. The marketplace is full. The people are jostling for their positions to get in line or to get in the front there to, to barter for these goods and things they wanted. Children are chasing each other through the crowds. There's a smell of body odor and fresh fish and produce and all these scents and scenes and things you see. Uh, dogs barking, hot air there blowing, dust is everywhere. And this bazaar would have been located probably among the narrow winding streets of the city. And so the vendors there who are selling their goods have them laid out before the people in their open air booths. And there's no price tags on these items. You have to barter for your purchase, and the price is determined by your ability to negotiate. And here's where Jesus places this pearl merchant that he's talking about here in this, these two verses. He's probably a poor man. He's carrying his, uh, the product that he sells maybe in the pockets located in the, the folds of his robe. He can't afford a booth. His pearls that he carry are inferior ones. The colors may be inconsistent in one. There may not be a perfectly round or, or teardrop shape in another. And some maybe have some chips on those outer layers. But each one of those pearls does have some value. But because they're not perfect, the value of the pearls that he has is, is not very much. And so this merchant has spent his whole life eking out a living by selling these little imperfect gems that he has. But one day, according to Jesus, and according to this story he told, this parable, he's making his way through the market, and, he, and, and as he's making his way, and he stops at the, a merchant who's selling pearls, and there he sees displayed before him this dark gray mother of pearl. It's perfectly round, and those layers on it, the outer layers kind of absorb the sun. They kind of reflect the light off. It shimmers. It looks like it's alive to him. And he sees it, and he can't imagine the worth that it might be, that it might have. And so he picks up the, the, the pearl, and he, and, he, and he 
looks at it and he calculates what it's worth and he, and he reaches in his pocket and he looks at the ones that he has and he recognizes their worth and he determines in his mind that if he can sell those pearls that he has and sell his home and everything that he has, that he would have enough to purchase this one beautiful pearl. So he faces a great moment of decision. He knows the price that he has to pay. He has to weigh the pros and the cons. He has to think of the consequences. He has to decide, is this pearl of great price worth the cost that I'm going to have to pay for it? So there's risk involved for him. His clientele will change. By, you know, he's been selling these little uh, trinkets, so to speak. Now, all of a sudden, all he's going to have is one pearl. So his whole clientele is going to change now. It's a different f folks that will come to, to, to shop with him now. He takes his chance. He decides to liquidate everything that he has and it, that he owns to purchase this one pearl. Don't miss the point that Jesus said the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. Don't miss that. Don't miss it. As we wander through this life with the time that God has allotted us here, looking for those, that which we desire, there are lots of appealing options before us. Lots of things. You have to have an eye for what is truly most important. That's why over and over Jesus said, you people, you've got eyes to see, but you don't see. You've got ears to hear, but you don't hear. And I want to think now about this pearl in, in, in real terms for just a moment, because it will help us understand the spiritual nature of this parable. Pearls were probably the most priceless jewels in Jesus' day. Pearls were perceived in the first century much the way that we perceive diamonds today. And they were the most valuable gem in the world at the time. And they were, often were exquisite. They were rare. In fact, I read that Roman General uh, Vitellius financed an entire military campaign by selling just one of his mother's pearl earrings. As most of you know, pearls are created in oysters when a small particle of foreign matter, whether it be sand or something else, uh, finds its way sometime into the shell, under that soft tissue inside the shell. And, and when that oyster can't expel the irritant, it produces a substance called nacre. And it's also, we've probably heard the term mother of pearl. And so it begins to produce this substance to coat and to cover that, that irritating substance that's found its way inside. And over the years, more and more layers are added until we find you have whatever size pearl that you have when that shell is opened. And so Jesus brilliantly uses this object lesson of a priceless gem, which by the world standards is, is of an inestimable value. And he said, this is what the kingdom is is like. Jesus told these stories that were so simple, and yet in their application they were so profound. They were layers and layers of meaning in the things that he said. And in using this priceless gem in his story, Jesus is saying that the things that the world places value on may or, or may not be the things of real importance after all. And so today, we look around us, you know, you can see the multitudes, the people around, they're, they're scrambling after certain things, and we see all the people seeking and searching and trying to attain uh, all these things around us. We decide because so many people are seeking these prizes that they must be of great value because that's what everybody's going after. And so we get pulled into that. And we conclude, whether subconsciously or whether consciously, that they are in actuality worth pursuing and pursuing in spite of what we might have a nagging conviction about in our minds and hearts. Whether the focus is on a relationship goals or academic goals or 
financial goals or even physical or retirement goals. Jesus says, after all these things the Gentiles seek, but he adds after, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what Wall Street says. It doesn't matter what the S&P looks like. It doesn't matter what your blood pressure or your cholesterol level is. It doesn't matter what your 401k or your marital status is. One day soon, much to the sad surprise of many people, many people, Jesus will come in the clouds with all the holy angels, and all that will matter on that day is the value that you put on the pearl of great price. As a boy, we had lots of animals. I was raised in the country, and we had lots of animals. And at one point, I, I, we raised pigs, and we often would have them for a few years, and we wouldn't have them, then we'd have them again. But we raised pigs, and, and I, as a boy, I would, you know, part of my duty sometimes was to feed those pigs. And so, you know, a lot of times we'd take like a bucket of corn. You know, we had a field, and, and all the old corn, the corn that didn't have the, what was inferior, we'd feed to the hogs. And so you'd take a bucket of corn, you'd throw it out there for the pigs. And a lot of times, if you've ever had pigs, you've ever fed pigs, one of those crazy old pigs would grab one husk of corn and make a mad dash across the pig pen with it. Like he, and, and what would happen was uh, two or three other pigs would start chasing after him, trying to get that one piece of corn when I dumped enough corn for all the pigs to have plenty to eat. But somehow they see the one going and they think he's, he, he's after, he's got the real thing, and so they chase after that pig. How do you explain that? They simply couldn't throw off the conviction in their pea-sized brains that the fact that this companion of theirs that was running away so frantically was proof positive that he had something bigger and better than anything else out there that I just poured in that slop bucket. And we too, brothers and sisters, are constantly being taken in by this pig pen philosophy. How many of us are spending our lives in the pursuit of prizes whose worth uh, we have no better proof of than they're being sought out by the crowd? We're chasing things, that, and the only reason we're chasing them because other people are chasing them as well. And so we think there's got to be value in that. This is what they're doing. This is what the majority are doing. This is what all the young people are doing. This is what all the people my age are doing. Whatever it is. Notice that it wasn't an accident that the merchant found the pearl. Verse 45 again. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man. Notice it says, seeking goodly pearls. He was actively seeking. He wasn't sleeping in and arriving late at the marketplace. He was there waiting for the market to open. He was pounding the pavement, even though it would have just been dust. Actually, it wouldn't have been a paved road probably. But he was pounding the road, searching for that pearl, that one precious pearl that he, was, that he knew was what he need, was searching for. And when he finally saw it, to his, if he was surprised at all, it wasn't because he, he had not found a number of excellent pearls in his his search, but it was because he found one pearl that so clearly surpassed the worth of all these other pearls that he had found in his searches over the years. There are a lot of shiny things in this world that can grab our attention and it can hold our focus. And what's imperative for you and I is that we don't let these shiny things hinder our search for that which is most important. Many of you know, uh, most of you who are regulars here know that I like to, as I put it, fool with cars and trucks. Um, I'm a car guy, and buying and selling Silverados and Camaros has been a thing for me since I've been 15 years old. Uh, I, I come by it honestly. I've got older half-brothers that were into racing. One of them owned a, uh, they built racing subframes, and they were always into racing and stock car racing all those years. And, but even more so, from my earliest memory, my uh, next-door neighbor, a friend of mine, he was about three or four years older than me. But he, from our youngest age, we, you know, we were riding bicycles. He was really into taking things apart. And we, he had me, we'd go to his dad's garage. We'd take our bicycles apart. We'd put them back together. We'd chop the forks off other bikes. Have you ever done that and made choppers? You hammer them onto the end of your forks. Young boys, y'all hear that? Chop the forks off another bike, hammer them onto the end of your forks, and then put your wheel on there. Hopefully when you pop wheelies, they'll stay on there. Sometimes they don't. But, but anyway, we did all these things. We took our bikes apart. Then 
then we got into motorcycles. We were always taking our motorcycles apart and working on them. And then when we got to the age when he got to, he could have cars. We couldn't yet. I started watching him mechanic and learning mechanic from him and his dad, who was a mechanic. And so I've always been involved with cars. It's always fascinating. It's always been a way for me um, to kind of, you know, it distresses me. It's a hobby of mine. And, and so anyway, um, he was into Ford trucks and the Mustangs. No offense to any of you Ford fans, but that did, part didn't rub off on me. All this other did. I'm a, I'm a, a Silverado and a, I'm a Chevy fan. I'm into Camaros and Silverados. But this fooling with cars has always been a, a way of de-stressing, if you will. And, and uh, you know, I've always got my little Camry I call my preacher car. And I always like to have either a Camaro or a Silverado on the side that I'm always fooling with or tinkering with, and I'll work on it, then I'll get rid of it, and I'll buy another one, whatever. Um, but when I'm looking for a car or a truck, th there was a point earlier on as I was doing this that I, a lot of times I focused on the exterior. I want to make sure it looked good. You know, the engine and all that was secondary in my mind. And I, I don't exclude that anymore, but my focus now is more on other things like the engine and the drivetrain and some other things that the mileage, those sort of things. You know, there's nothing wrong with looking. Let me help you understand what I'm sharing. There's nothing wrong with looking for a nice ride, I suppose. But the problem is that when we focus on what is shiny, we can miss sometimes that which is most important. Many of us are just focusing on the shiny things of this world, and at some point, they, I guarantee you, will lose their luster. This merchant was looking for something special. Jesus tells us that he simply had to have this pearl. This man felt so strongly about this newfound precious pearl that he sold everything he owned in order to be able to raise the funds to be able to purchase it. And frankly, I thought about it as I was trying to think about the, this, these two sentences. I thought, well, as wonderful and as beautiful as that pearl might have been, the purchase by the merchant really doesn't make good business sense, if you think about it. After all, most business majors will tell you, you know, you have to diversify. Don't put all your eggs into one basket or, you know, it takes money to make money. He's gotten rid of all of his money. He has no cash now to do anything with. He's only got one thing now. That's all he has. Like I said before, his clientele would change. Everything would change for him now. And that is precisely Jesus' point. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven... Uh, or, and, and it is of such value, overwhelming value, that everything else in this life pales in comparison. Listen to me. Everything you have is worth nothing when what you seek is worth everything. Everything is the price uh, uh, that you are, if everything is the price you're willing to pay when you find something that makes everything else seem worthless in comparison. Let me say that again. Everything is the price you will be willing to pay when you find something that makes everything else seem worthless in comparison. This crazy merchant realized that he had found perfection. He no longer needed to continue his search, so he liquidated everything he had so he could have it. And some people, instead of buying, we try and content ourselves by uh, taking or talking about the beauty of the pearl and wishing that it was ours, and we discuss it, and we do this, and we do that, and we go to seminars about it, and we, we do, you know, but, but we never make the purchase. There's an old gentleman, an old man, and um, he stood up in a prayer meeting one night, and he was going to give his testimony, and he was one of those men that, uh, you know, the listeners, as they saw him, they knew his life. They had saw him live. And he's one of those, had one of those beautiful, inspiring stories. And the listeners heard the authenticity and the conviction that he shared. And they had witnessed, like I said, his corresponding life. And when the old man finished his testimony and sat down, one young man, one young fellow stood up and he said, I would give the world for that man's experience. To which the old man replied, that's exactly what it cost me. That's just the price that too many of us are willing to pay. We refuse to pay that price. This priceless pearl is not for the man who merely wishes for it. It is for the man or woman who, regardless of cost, 
wills to possess it. And we may not admit it, but, and maybe we've not yet realized it, but sometimes we can allow church even to be our bailout. We can become spiritual sightseers who feel like we've done our duty by sitting in church and listening and we let someone else worship for us and study for us and pray for us. Pastor Mark Patterson, or, or Batterson put it this way. He said, most of us are educated way beyond the level of our obedience. What we need is not another sermon. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. We need to study the Word of God diligently, but we don't need to know more. We need to do more with what we know. At the end of the day, God will not say, well thought, intellectual, or well said, orator. There's only one commendation, well done, good and faithful servant. Jesus is the pearl. Jesus is the pearl. But the prize doesn't come with us without us making a conscious decision that the pearl and the prize is worth anything and everything that we have. The price has to be placed, uh, the, the price uh, that we're willing to pay for this prize has to be placed above all earthly considerations and all earthly relationships. Christ's Object Lessons, page 115 and 16 in your bulletin says this, in the parable, the pearl is not represented as a gift. The merchant man brought it, bought it at the price of all that he had. Many question the meaning of this since Christ is represented in the scriptures as a gift. He is a gift, but only to those who give themselves soul, body, and spirit to him without reserve. We are to give ourselves to Christ to live a life of willing obedience to all his requirements. All that we are, all the talents and capabilities we possess are the Lord's to be consecrated to his service. When we thus give ourselves wholly to him, Christ, with all the treasures of heaven, gives himself to us, and we obtain the pearl of great price. It's a gift, but it's not free. You see, this merchant, it, it, it never was really about the money at all to him. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 6, he said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And he said in Matthew 7, 7, uh, those who seek will find. But in this story, this two-verse story, Jesus is telling some for the first time and reminding others of us for the millionth time that he is the pearl of great price. And when Christ truly dwells in our hearts and the kingdom of heaven becomes our passion, everything else should fade into insignificance. And it's then that we're freed from the slavery of the world's values and the things that we're accustomed to and the idolatry that says physical things are of primary importance, not spiritual things. We have to reach the point where the pearl of great price is worth any price that we can possibly pay. Back then, pearl hunting involved a lot of danger. You know, they don't have the modern things that we have today. And since the pearl oyster thrives in an average depth of about 40 feet, they say, uh, a pearl wasn't a treasure you would just stumble upon generally walking along the beach. You would find one there. In biblical times, they were obtained at great cost uh, and as far as in, in human terms, a lot of people died trying to, uh, while they were pearl hunting. They didn't have the things, you know, they didn't have the equipment that we have to go under like we do today. First century pearl hunting, as I was reading, equipment consisted of basically a rope and a rock. A pearl diver would, would tie a large rock to his body, he would hang on to a large rock, he would jump over the side of a boat, allowing the weight of the, of the rock to carry him down to the bottom, and then he would search down to try and find the oyster beds and to, to, to collect all these oysters and bring them up, cut himself loose from the rock and bring himself back to the top. And the average of finding a pearl oyster was 1,000 to one. So out of every 1,000 pearls, you had to go through 1,000 before you would find one pearl, generally speaking. And all this while, you know, whenever he'd go down collecting how many ever he could, he's holding his breath, trying to hope that he doesn't drown, trying to get back to the top before he does. And so the parable of this pearl, it requires us to think and examine our personal lives and ask some questions. For example, at this point in your life, are you 
recklessly, if you will, it might seem, selling off everything you have so you can get hold of that one pearl of great price. Or are you diversifying? Are you placing your eggs in some different baskets for safety reasons maybe or whatever it is? You know, there are people who don't buy because they're waiting for the price to be marked down even. They, they can see the, the cost of the pearl. They can see its worth. And they feel that one day I'm going to claim this pearl, but, but I'm going to wait till it's a little cheaper than the price I'm asked to pay. And I've got to tell you this, brothers and sisters, as time elapses, as we grow closer and closer to the coming of Jesus, that price is not, it, it's, it's only escalating. It's not going to get easier and easier to accept Jesus. It's not going to get easier and easier to stand for Jesus. It's not going to get easier and easier to, to stand for truth or to follow the word or to follow whatever it is, especially as we see the society around us, even the Christians around us, even the Christians in this congregation perhaps at one point starting to oppose what the Bible says. I have to tell you, again, you know, I've met people that tell me as a pastor, you know, well, basically they say, one day I'm going to make that decision. But now I've got some things in my life that, you know, I'm struggling with or, I, you know, whatever it is. They have excuses and, and um, they're waiting for dollar day in the kingdom. If this is the case, then you and I may never be able to understand this astonishing two-verse parable of Jesus. We don't have eyes that see or ears that hear. There's a story I read about a young monk in one of those illustration books and years ago, and it said there, there was this young monk who asked one of the old wise uh, men of the desert, <clears throat> he asked him, why do so many people come to the desert to try and find God, to seek God in the solitude there? And, and yet, he says, most of them, after a while, they give up and, and they return to their lives in the city. And the old monk launched into a story that seemed like it was totally unrelated. And he said this. He said, last night, my dog saw a rabbit uh, running for cover among the bushes. And he began to bark and to chase that rabbit. He said, soon after, other dogs began to chase. They began to join in the chase. They began barking. They began running. And they ran a great distance and got attention of many other dogs. And they got more and more and louder. And soon the whole wilderness was echoing with the sound of these barking dogs. And their pursuit went on and on into the night. But after a while, many of the dogs, they began to get tired. And they, they dropped out. And a few of them chased the rabbit until the night was almost over, he said. But finally, by the morning, he said, my dog was the only dog that was still left in the hunt and he stopped and asked the young man do you understand what I've told you and the young monk said no please explain he said it's simple he said my dog saw the rabbit have you seen the rabbit have you recognized the worth of the pearl if truly so then all other things will begin to pale in comparison. The moral of this story in Matthew is simply this. Jesus says it's time for those of us who are his followers to sell out on this world. It's time to cash in all those things that we've considered precious and entirely invest into his kingdom. And one of the greatest reasons why the church in America is anemic today is because it lacks people who passionately seek Jesus and there are, that are willing to sell or surrender everything in the process for him. There has to come a time when we decide with all our will that everything that does not matter to Jesus and that does not uh, make our relationship to him grow stronger, it has to come out. You know, for, for years and years, I had a hard knot right here on the back of my arm. For years, for decades, literally for decades, I had a spot right here on my arm. It was hard as a rock. I didn't know what it was. And for years it was there. And um, 
I didn't know, I didn't, I couldn't figure out what it was, but it was in the same area that I had had uh, when I'd had a car wreck back in 19, February of 1991. I'd had a car wreck and I have some scars there and scars here and scars there and scars everywhere basically from that wreck. But there's some scars there and it was in the area of those scars. And, uh, but whenever I would accidentally bump this on something, I'd have my arm on the table or, or play in a sport and somebody would run into it or whatever, it would get red, it would get sore. And, and just a few months ago, in December of 2020, just this last year, it, it got really sore, and and um, you know I I didn't I never knew what it was. I never really addressed it or tried to medicate it in any way. It was just kind of a mystery to me. I didn't know what it was. But back in December, Christina put some charcoal on this thing and a bandaid over it, and put some charcoal on it, and I didn't think much about it. After all, it had been there for 30 years, as long as I could remember. But after that charcoal application. On, that, on December 23rd, there appeared to me, I was looking at that arm, and there was something kind of shiny there, on my, sticking out of the skin. It was hard to distinguish, and it's not relating to my failing eyesight, I'm sure. But, but, but I kind of just pulled it a little bit, and a piece of glass came out of my arm. Just kidding. This is off the pulpit. I don't know where somebody, I don't know who's been preaching so hard they're tearing up the pulpit, but anyway. Here's the piece of glass. I saved it. It's about a quarter of an inch long. Nothing on it, no blood, there's nothing on it, just a clear little piece of glass. And I would imagine, because I went through the windshield, that I've had a piece of Nissan glass, windshield glass, in my arm for three decades. And it finally came out. Why not share that with you? Because God is trying to work out every sin and every defect into our lives and in our characters. He is trying to get all those. It doesn't matter how long you, you've been addicted. It doesn't matter how long you've been struggling. Jesus wants, he wants all of that stuff to come out of us. And he can do it. He can do it. And, and if we make the decision to allow him to do that, I, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. This pearl of great price is worth everything that I have. And you make that surrender, he's going to start to do some amazing things in your lives. It's just the natural result of a relationship with Jesus. He's trying to help us to see that all the world has to offer us is worth absolutely nothing in comparison to what he has to offer us. So my question this morning is, 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 is how about you? What are you after? You know, if you were to win the prize for which your life is striving right now, what would it be? Would it be an education? A spouse? A better job? A retirement account that's fluffed up? What would it be? Or would it be Jesus? What would it be? And the question, again, I want to press on your hearts is, is, are you sold out for that pearl? If not, the reason is not too hard to find. We've not been willing to pay the price. Christ's Object Lessons, page 117, says this, There are some who seem to be always seeking for the heavenly pearl, but they do not make an entire surrender of their wrong habits. They don't die to self that Christ may live in them. Therefore, notice... They do not find the precious pearl. There we go. So let's go back now to this other option. We talked about the beginning. There were two options. That pearl could be you and I. That pearl could be Jesus. We've talked about Jesus. And, but, but Jesus sees us, of course. We're to see him as the pearl. But Jesus sees us as that pearl. And you know, when we know that God literally bankrupted heaven for you and I. Christ's Object Lesson, page 118, says this, The parable of the merchant man seeking goodly pearls has a double, double significance. It applies not only to men as seeking the kingdom of heaven, but of Christ as seeking his lost inheritance. Christ, the heavenly merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, saw in lost humanity the pearl of great price. So therefore, all of heaven's treasury was emptied for you and I. 
Is there anything you can think of that you would go and drain your bank account and withdraw all of your life savings from your 401ks, or whatever it is, to give for? This morning, will you say to Jesus, I, I, want, I want to give it all. I see, I recognize you are the pearl of great price. And I've been tinkering around the edges. I've been considering opening that door of my heart all these years. But I've never quite thrown it open yet. Will you let this price be paid in vain? It's time for us, brothers and sisters. Jesus is coming soon. It's time for us to move past the theoretical and move to the experiential. Paul said today is the day of salvation. Don't keep waiting for dollar day or, or that going out of business sale. The price you pay will never, hear me, the price you pay will never be less than it is today. Because the longer you wait, the longer I wait, the more expensive it is going to be to obtain. Come to Jesus. Sell out everything for Jesus. You know, the relationship with Jesus begins, it's him knocking on the door of our heart, so to speak. You know, the old phrase, and we see the picture, and we read about it in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. And we see this picture of Jesus knocking on our heart's door, and we think we throw open the doors, and we're good. But you know, once Jesus comes in, he doesn't stop knocking. He, he's knocking first on the door of our hearts, but once we let him in, he starts knocking on the closet doors. He doesn't just want in, brothers and sisters. He wants all. And that's all that he will accept. Today, make that decision. G let Jesus be your all in all. Make that surrender to him. I'm giving it all to Jesus. I'm surrendering everything to you, Lord. I don't know everybody's situation here today, though I do know many. Make a commitment. And what I want to do is ask you this morning. We're going to sing our, after I pray. We're going to have our, our closing song. But I want to ask you to make a commitment today. I want you to, if, if you're willing to say, Jesus, I, I want to surrender all to you. I want to, I want to give all I've got for this pearl of great price. I want to ask you if you would stand with me. We're going to have our closing prayer. If you'd like to do that, please stand with me now. And we're going to pray and ask Jesus to help us. Lord, this morning, you see those of us who are standing here. And by our standing, we're saying we recognize you are um, the, the pearl of great price. You are of inestimable value. And so, Lord, though our everything is really worth nothing, we're offering it to you today. We're offering and asking you to take our sinful, broken selves as we come to this throne by faith this morning. And we're praying that you'll convert this broken sinfulness and, and all that we are offering you into a price, Lord, that's acceptable in heaven that, that opens and throws open the, the doors to the, to the treasure house of heaven and gives us this pearl. And Lord, we acknowledge that we can only do this by your power, that if, if we even feel this inclination, it's you doing that in us as well. And so we're grateful for that. But Lord, I pray that not a person here today that's hearing my voice, whether here in this sanctuary or in the gym or online, whatever it might be, that Lord, if they're recognizing that call, and they'll recognize that the price we're going to pay is never going to be cheaper than it is today. Please help us. Help us, Lord. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.